the invitation to be here, um, Jennifer and Penelope, and for everybody for coming together and supporting this event. It's really awesome to see everybody in the room. And um, I'd like to dedicate my talk today to a scholar named Don Lacoste, who I wish I had had the chance to meet. And I feel like he should be here with us, um, but he's really in my friend Ron Sokolsky about Don trying to get details about what he was like but uh, so if I just click this will it come up it's I know we're on a tight schedule so um but I just want to say in reflection with um, Michael's comments which I really enjoyed um, thank you um, I've been thinking about revolution as well as a tactic and so my current book project on work actually deals with the idea of sabotage or subterfuge related to um, worker histories as well as direct actions such as strikes. So thinking of smaller scale or um, a kind of subtext actions that are maybe not all encompassing like revolution. Chicago surrealism ignited the World War I era, European surrealist legacy, legacy of sabotage into radical activism with collaborative publications such as the journals Rebel Worker and Arsenal, and group membership in the Industrial Workers of the World, IWW Union, which was founded in Chicago in 1910. Following in the footsteps of André Breton, who envisioned an applied praxis for surrealism, and in that effort sought contact with a number of intellectuals such as Sigmund Freud during the 1920s, the Chicago surrealists Franklin and Penelope Rosemont and their friends attempted to connect their protest culture to that of World War I era surrealism through an extended dialogue with the Frankfurt School philosopher Herbert Mokuza during the 1970s. The Chicago surrealist attack on the repressive work ideology that Marcuse called the performance principle in late capitalist labor systems is therefore founded in 19th and early 20th century anarchist, Marxist, and surrealist critiques of wage labor, but is also inflected with a distinctly new left valorization of the pleasure principle in the midst of this resistance. According to Chicago surrealist Penelope Rosemont, quote, to be effective, the struggle to abolish work must become conscious, vocal, public, organized, and international, end quote. At the turn of the new millennium, Rosemont published a compact but powerful meditation called A Brief Rant Against Work, with particular attention to the relation of work to white supremacy, sexism, and miserabilism. Building on four decades of surrealist activism based in Chicago and networked internationally, Rosemont's essay condenses an array of positions and ideas that influenced the Chicago group since its inception. Um, to, uh, from the mid-1960s on. Karl Marx's mid-19th century call for the abolition of work is involved, as is André Breton's mid-20th century condemnation of miserabilism, and particular attention is devoted to Marcuse's post-World War II concepts of the pleasure principle, the performance principle, and negative thinking, which of course are built on pre-war Freudian concepts. Um, Rosemont writes, quote, Work is at the center of all these problems. It is work that keeps the whole miserable system going. Without work, the death-dealing juggernaut that proclaims itself for the free market would grind to a halt. Free market means freedom for capital and unfreedom for those who work. Until the problem of work is solved, that is, until work is abolished, all other problems will not only remain, but will keep getting worse. Of all the manifestations of international surrealism over the course of the 20th century, it is Chicago surrealism that has been most directly tied to the overt critique of wage labor and capitalism and the activist fight for worker rights through various tactics that were more often than not aestheticized and surrealized in some manner, including striking protests and the systematic devaluation of the work to live principle. So I'm <coughs> suggesting that there's a, a you know, kind of um, connection here of aesthetics with uh, political reform. I argue that the exchange between Marcuse and the Chicago Surrealists should be seen as one of mutual affinity and influence, rather than a case of one uniquely poetic facet of American New Left um, counterculture proponents looking to the elder of the Frankfurt School for theoretical validation and inspiration. For Marcuse, the young Americans, whoops, there we go, <clears throat> named Franklin and Pen Penelope Rosemont and their friends, were a living example of the radicalism of surrealism, a demonstration of the identity of surrealism as praxis rather than just theory, and this call for revolt through art as a kind of sabotage 
and aesthetics resounds loud and clear in Marcuse's last two books pictured here and is sometimes directly tied to surrealism in Marcuse's analysis. And actually, there was a conversation going on between the Chicago Surrealists and Marcuse, um, who actually asked them to comment on Counter-Revolution and Revolt, which is really cool. For the Rosemonts and their friends, Marcuse's call for a great refusal of capitalism and its repressive way of life bolstered and strengthened their own highly specific position, even more so than it did for the European Surrealists in the 1960s, who recognize the compatibility of Marcuse's approach with their own. And I know we'll be hearing more about this from Michael Stone Richards after, after my talk. Um, Franklin Rosemont and Marcuse were, in a certain regard, comrades. They called each other as much in their epistolary exchange, which took, which took place for the most part over the course of 72 and 73, but also continued right up until Marcuse's death in 79, and resulted in a really fascinating bundle of letters, which I'm working through right now. The key question that Franklin Rosemont posed to Marcuse as the subject of their correspondence and the whole group supported this question at the time was, quote, what is your estimate of the present and future viability of surrealism? So this is what Franklin asks Marcuse in a letter, not, not this one. Um, Marcuse's 1955 Eros and Civilization was already an important book for Franklin Rosemont and his friends at Roosevelt University in Chicago. By the first time the first issue of their mimeographed leftist magazine, The Rebel Worker, was published on May Day of 1964. Mm -hmm. Surrealism was firmly in place as Franklin's dominant ideology by that time. After dropping out of high school, Franklin was admitted to Roosevelt University in Chicago in spring of 61, where he met Larry DeCoster and several others. In January of 1963, when DeCoster was about to turn 21 and Franklin was just 19, and about a year and a half before Franklin met Penelope Bartik, uh, soon to become his wife, he and DeCoster hitchhiked to Mexico City. According to DeCoster in a recent interview with me, they met Leonora Crank at her, at her home there and she fed them a meal that they really enjoyed. The pair visited New York City in circa 1963, which is still kind of foggy dates, where they had a meeting with uh, French surrealist Claude Turneau, who was still in town at that time after helping Marcel Duchamp the exhibition Surrealist Intrusion into the Enchanter's Domain that showed there at the Gallery Darcy from 60 to 61. Franklin and DeCoster appear in issue 5 of the Parisian Surrealist Journal La Breche from October 1963 in a letter from Turner to Robert Benayoun announcing the intention of the young Americans to commence a Surrealist Journal and his general support of their enthusiasm. Franklin and Penelope Rosemont would later befriend Benayoun in Paris in 66. Now, the Chicago surrealist admiration for Marcuse is understandable, given this fortuitous exposure of older members to older members of the avant-garde, and of course the fact that Marcuse was already internationally famous when Franklin and his friends formed the Anti-Poetry Club at Roosevelt University and started publishing Rebel Worker and opening their bookshop Solidarity um, in the Lincoln Park neighborhood in 64, 65. At the same time, it must be remembered that in the book that made Marcuse world famous, uh, One Dimensional Man, Marcuse describes the full integration of the working class into the capitalist system in the United States and Europe after World War II, to the degree that a largely proletarian-driven revolution was no longer feasible. For the Chicago Surrealists, who were as much members of the IWW Wobblies as they were Surrealists, the proletariat had certainly not lost its crucial role in a desired overthrow of technocratic capitalism. And thus, this was one point of disagreement that came up between Marcuse and the group. Their bookshop, Solidarity, was named after a venerable IWW phrase that signified the wobbly stance of solidarity between classes, races, genders, and nationalities, between both anarchists and socialists, and the struggle for workers' rights through a unified front of industrial unionism rather than specialized craft unionism. Their point of view was that the mid-century discrediting of Freud's theory of the repressiveness of civilization in his 1930 book, Das Unbehagen in der Kultur, The Civilization and Its Discontents, was essentially a capitalist ploy to emphasize the one-dimensional kind of freedom allowed by a free market. According to Franklin, theirs was a unique form of working class psychoanalysis, unusual in the United States at that time. In an essay from 2005, Franklin writes a passage that resonates with the anti-psychiatry views active in the 70s from writers such as Gilles Deleuze and Felix Guattari, who also, of course, paid heed to Marcuse. So this is from Franklin 
Herbert Marcuse's Eros and Civilization, with its surrealist emphasis on the release of erotic energy as a defining element of revolution, was a particularly important book for us and served as a guide through the maze of psychoanalytic literature. At a time when such liberal reformists as Eric Erickson and Eric Fromm were much in fashion, we vigorously upheld a radical, non-medical, non-therapeutic analysis, a kind of wobbly anarcho-Freudianism with crucial strategic implications. It's a great quote. Surrealists in France had been intrigued with Marcuse since the early 1960s, and Michael Richardson commented on this a bit in relationship to the 1968 exhibition. Um, certainly with the translation and into French of Eris and Civilization in 63, and I really enjoyed seeing this range of 1963 French book covers kind of increasing in counterculture interest. Um, and then as you go later into the 60s, um, they really take it to the extreme um, with the French cover there of the biker girl there. Um, Marcus's two major books on Hegel's ontology and dialectical theory from 32 and 41 may also have captured surrealist attention in France. Uh, but they weren't actually translated into French, even those earlier books, until the 60s and 70s. Of course, some Surrealists read German. In issue 5 of the Surrealist journal La Breche, in October of 63, Gérard Legrand cites a short text by Marcuse in his larger discussion of Freud and Norman O'Brown and the concepts of Eros and Thanatos. In December of 66, about a year after the closing of the Le Car Absolute exhibition at the Gallery de Loy in Paris, Michelle Pearson interviewed Herbert Marcuse about revolutionary emancipation and oppression in a brief discussion, later printed in issue two of this journal, L'Archivoire, in October of 67. The interview focuses on Eros and civilization, and Marcuse emphasizes to his interlocutor the importance of oppositional libertarian aggression as a form of counterintelligence, counterpropaganda, counterimages, and counterlanguage. As a concrete link between French Surrealism and Marcuse, the interview in Narchibra took on major significance for the rebel worker group, well before they began to correspond with the philosopher in 71. When the Rosemonts were staying in Paris in the, uh, in the winter and spring of 66, they co-wrote an important essay with and for their French friends entitled Situation of Surrealism in the US, which opens with a tribute to Marcuse and his call for a non-repressive civilization. Years later, later, Franklin Rosemont retrospectively called issue five of their journal Rebel Worker from March of 66 a demonstration of the Marcusean idea of the power of negative thinking and the politics of the pleasure principle as a rebellion against work. So what I'm trying to do is link this interest in Marcuse to a larger framework that was already in place related to the IWW, but also surrealism's interest in the abolition of work. In a joint publication between the group's Black Swan Press and Paul Buell's Students for a Democratic Society affiliated journal Radical America, a pamphlet containing a translation by Guy Ducournay of the interview that had first appeared in Archibra, as well as Marcuse's previously unpublished lecture, The Obsolescence of Psychoanalysis, was released in an unauthorized copy in 1968. Moreover, the argument can be made that between 65 and 72, there was a significant international interest in Marcuse's work in surrealism in general, Paris, um, certainly the United States, and uh, Prague, as we've heard, with the Chicago group picking up steam with attraction to Marcuse in 68 and maintaining a strength of interest thereafter. So I'm, I'm really suggesting that the Marcuse influence becomes dominant for the American group. Ultimately, however, um, and I do want to show you the catalog for the um, Pleasure Principle exhibition in, in uh, 68 that Michael told us about. Ultimately, however, it was the Chicago group that maintains the most profound investment in Marcuse's ideas, and I posit that his influence is also apparent throughout the group's important marvelous freedom, vigilance of desire, world surrealist exhibition uh, that took place in Chicago in 76. So the Le Car Absolute exhibition in the mid-60s took its title from the Fourierist notion of absolute deviation, which in itself resonates with Marcuse's call for a great refusal in his Eros and Civilization and One Dimensional Man. When the Rosemonts arrived in Paris during the last days of 65 and befriended the Surrealists involved with Le Car Absolute, uh, they became, of course, very familiar with uh, objects such as the consumer that Jennifer told us about, um, uh, the collective work by Jean-Claude Silverman that would be critiquing consumption and production in a capitalist society. 
Um, and uh, therefore linking more specifically, perhaps in their minds, the interest in Fourier for the Surrealists with this idea of pleasure in daily life with Marcuse's idea of the pleasure principle as a counter work tactic. So here again is the, um, the consumer there <laughs> with uh, its oven in the middle. Franklin Rosemont writes that, quote, Marcuse's all-out assault on the ideology of consumer society and his one-dimensional man provided part of the theoretical background of Le Count Absolute. So there's a kind of ground there for Marcuse. After spending an extraordinarily productive winter and spring in Paris in the mid-60s and meeting much of the Surrealist group, as well as members of the SI, the Rosemonts returned to Chicago and contributed to the last issue of Rebel Worker, number seven, Meanwhile, um, at the University of Wisconsin, Paul Buell founded the aforementioned SDS-affiliated radical journal, Radical America, which would continue publication for the next 20 years. And I'm sorry, this was connected to uh, Franklin's quote about the Marcusean influence of, um, of Le Carre Absolute. Now I'm going to show you pictures of Radical America. The first issue of Volume 4 of Radical America from 1970 was a special guest issue edited by the Rosemonts entitled Surrealism in the Service of the Revolution, featuring a number of Chicago-based Surrealists as well as Surrealists in France and other, others. Thanks to Buell, who was in contact with a doctoral candidate in philosophy at SUNY Buffalo, Paul Picone, the founding editor of the radical journal Telos, the Rosemonts and some of their friends pictured here were invited to speak at the second Telos International Conference in 1971 in November held at the State University of New York, Buffalo. Telos had been founded as a philosophy, uh, philosophy and critical theory journal in May of 68, and was deeply indebted to Marxist critical theory, in particular the Frankfurt School. Buell, Picone, and the Telos group made contact and began collaborations starting with the November 1969 issue of Radical America, focusing on the subject of youth culture, and edited by Picone and Telos affiliates calling themselves the Buffalo Collective. So this is the Telos journal. It's like, I know a lot of communicating journals. And this is the Telos edited issue of Radical America. So you have to remember the surrealism issue of Radical America is very close in time and chron chronology to the Telos issue. Marcuse was the most famous speaker for the second Telos conference in Buffalo that the Rosemonts and their friends attended. His lecture, entitled Strategy for the Left, took place, perhaps appropriately, in the gymnasium. The summit advertised itself in the pages of Telos as follows. Without the question, the problem of organization is very urgent. The whole future of the American New Left depends on it. Each of the four days of this conference was devoted to the following topics. Um, it was really cool to find the program. Grassroots organization, party structures, totalization and intermediations, and bureaucracy and post revolutionary <coughs> problems. So here's a Telos ad with these um, categories. Franklin and Penelope Rosemont and their friends David Shanos and John Simmons set out from Chicago by automobile. According to Buell and John Simmons in recent interviews with me, Franklin, Simmons, and Shanos all wore suits to the conference as a form of satirical protest against the hippie fashions of the day. <laughs> Guy de Cornet, a French surrealist, also joined from Canada. Paul Buell attended from Wisconsin with students and spoke on a panel Penelope Rosemont attended but did not give a paper. Franklin Rosemont and Shanos appear on the same panel during the first morning of the conference right after the Cone's opening remarks. Franklin's paper, Surrealist Point of Departure, fused the poetic play of the Surrealist Revolution with the global, global workers' revolution. At 9.30 p.m. that Thursday night after many hours of conferencing, the Rosemont, uh, Rosemonts and their friends um, were on a panel related to radical media. That also included Telos, Radical America, um, Le Temps Moderne, and other European journals. The papers by Franklin, Rosemont, Shanos, and Simmons were distributed by the group at the conference, which is pretty interesting, um, in the form of this pamphlet called Surrealist Intervention, which had a drawing by Guy de Cornet on the back cover and a series of collaged found images in the text. So their papers were very critical of Telos, and I think it was a very bold statement to pass them out at the conference that Telos was hosting. Rosemont, Simmers, Simmons, and Shanos all pay homage to Marcuse in his papers, with Franklin quoting from Reason and Revolution and Negations, and Simmons leaning broadly on Eros and Civilization. Um, Shanos evoked Marcuse at large to attack the Maoists and other neo-Marxists. 
Following the Tilo summit, Franklin Rosemont corresponded with Marcuse for about a year and a half, just before the publication, publication of Counter Revolution and Revolt in 72. Yet, it is important to note that it was actually, this is Shingo's here, um, just in advance of the Tilo's conference that in fall 71 that Franklin begins corresponding with Marcuse. And they get, the group gets a really enthusiastic response <coughs> from Marcuse. Um, and here is John Simmons. So what Franklin sends uh, Marcuse in this early phase, um, before they actually meet in person at this Tilo's conference, is a couple of different surrealist publications as well as a letter. And I'm sorry for the quality of this um, this pamphlet here. The Ant Eater's Umbrella um, is an ecological protest um, poster with uh, drawings by Leonora Carrington, and they also mm -hmm. sent along um, this great um, pamphlet towards the Second Chicago Fire. Um, that described architects in Chicago, active in Chicago, um, such as Luc Corbusier and Lise Van der Rohe, and the quote, monarchist by pretension and swine by profession, Frank Lloyd Wright, um, and they called for insurrectionary, <laughs> insurrectionary arson in Chicago for a new second Chicago fire to clean the slate here. Um, the zoo broadside is a foyer's condemnations of the performative slavery of the zoological bestie. Marcuse was very enthusiastic about these pamphlets, um, and he said in a letter to Franklin, quote, it is somehow comforting to see how much our lines of thoughts converge. I hope you will recognize most, much of your animal leaflet in my new book, which was Counter-Revolution and Revolt. So in essence, Marcuse argues that it is not in style that surrealism achieves revolutionary praxis, and I say that because Marcuse did deal with style on and on in his comments. But he ultimately decides that surrealism, through aesthetics, stimulates revolutionary action. Uh, Franklin and Marcuse continue to correspond, but with much less frequently, uh, frequently until 79, when Marcuse generously wrote to Franklin to congratulate him on the publication of the What is Surrealism volume and reply to an invitation uh, for a symposium. In Counter-Revolution and a Revolt, which Marcuse was still writing at the time of the initial correspondence, he seems to provide a direct answer to the question that Rosemont had posed to him at the start of their exchange. So again, the question was, what is your estimate of the present and future viability of surrealism? And Marcuse affirms this viability with a quote that very much reminds me of his colleague, Walter Benjamin. And this is the Marcuse quote. If art dreams of liberation within the spectrum of history, dream realization through revolution must be possible. The Surrealist program must be valid." End quote. In 1972, thanks to the exchange with the Chicago group, Surrealism is still in the present tense for Marcuse. He signs his last letter to Franklin with the parting words, in solidarity. So to conclude, I think due in part to this transatlantic and transtemporal bridge provided by Marcuse's stance, the Chicago Surrealists were able to envision Marcuse's adaptation of Freud's pleasure principle as an overarching habitual sabotage of the repressive performance principle, wherein Surrealist methods such as automatism and other aestheticized forms of play and subversion function practically as well as symbolically moving into the realm of nonviolent direct action against a workerist mentality. Rather than functioning as a point of production resistance against productivity and paid labor, as the case as in the case